Bangladeshi Hindus and Bangladeshi Americans, primarily from the Queens, Bangladeshi Hindus and Bangladeshi Americans, primarily from the Queens area, so this neighborhood, came to Washington, D.C. and converged in order to protest the atrocities in their country, in, in their home country of Bangladesh. And that was, you should all give yourselves a round of applause, to say the least. Because that, because your voices may not have been heard by the president that day, but they will be heard. In fact, the next day, there was a journalist that I know, he's from uh, the Global, Global India Weekly, and he, he has a White House press pass. And so he asked Jay Carney, who is the uh, White House press correspondent in the, uh, the next day's press briefing, what was the president's response for, for, the, for the protest. And unfortunately, Mr. Carney said, unfortunately, we did not know about the protest. So what happens in front of their own door, they don't know sometimes, let alone what happens across the world in Bangladesh. But, that is why the Hindu American Foundation exists. Ten years ago, the Hindu American Foundation is in its tenth year of existence. In 2003, a group of young Hindu Americans, first, the second generation Hindus, who were born in this country or who were raised in this country, who were professionals, doctors, lawyers, engineers, economists, and so on, decided that it was time for Hindus in the United States to have that voice. It was time for Hindus in the United States to be able to speak up on behalf of persecuted Hindu minorities in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and many other countries around the world, as well as uh, when Hindus in the United States, when our rights are violated here. And so that is why the Hindu American Foundation exists today. And I can tell you, in Washington, D.C., we are the primary voice for the Bangladeshi Hindu community in ensuring that your plight is heard. I promise you that. So we were started 10 years ago, and I just want to take you through a journey of where, we, of where we've been and where we are today. Uh, nine years ago, we began publishing a human rights report. And every year of our report, we have always, we have always published a section on the plight of the Hindu minority of Bangladesh. And in 2004, we began writing this report, and so nine years later, we have our tenth, excuse me, nine years later, we have our ninth report, and I have copies in the back of this brief brochure, which is an abridged version of our report. You turn to the first page, and under the egregious violator section, that means people who, the countries that are very bad about ensuring the rights of their minorities, Bangladesh is on that, is on that page, and you can... Uh, I don't need to tell you what's happening to Hindus in Bangladesh because you know more than I do. I've never been to Bangladesh, but as a Hindu American, I find it very important to ensure that the voice of Hindus in Bangladesh is heard by their government as well as the government of the most powerful nation in the world, the United States. And beginning in uh, and in the early uh, excuse me in the early years of our advocacy, we began reporting on the enemy. Vested Property Act. We, had, we were reporting to the State Department and members of Congress and the Foreign Affairs Committee and Foreign Relations Committee. That the Enemy Vested Property Act was a detrimental piece of legislation to the minority communities of Bangladesh, that the minority communities of Bangladesh were continuing to face persecution at the hands of a, of a government that was led by, that was in uh, coalition with Islamic fundamentalist forces such as the Jamaat Islami and other organizations. And we, we were heard. And eventually our reports have been cited by the State Department, have been cited by the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. But that doesn't mean that's enough. And when the violence began early in 2013, the Hindu American Foundation used its interfaith resources. We sit on an international religious freedom roundtable organization. And we are the only Hindu group there, but we join forces with our Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, and Muslim partners. And we wrote a coalition letter to the House Foreign Affairs Committee and House Foreign Relations Committee chairman and told them that it is time for the House and the Senate to hear what is happening in Bangladesh in an, in an official hearing. And 
<clears throat> then we had a protest in front of the White House. And then, and then two months later, the Hindu American Foundation had a, and our 10th year anniversary advocacy day had 50 members from across the country advocating on behalf of Bangladeshi Hindus. That was one of our official advocacy points. And we met with over 40 congressional offices, House and Senate. And today I am here to tell you, I am pleased to tell you, that on November 20th, that's the day that's scheduled so far, it could change because it's changed three times since the government shut down. On November 20th, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, will have that hearing to hear the religious violence that is happening in Bangladesh, persecuting religious minorities, the Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, and the Ahmadi Muslims. The Chairman Shabat just went to Bangladesh this past week, and he has returned and now is ready to hear and is ready to and to is ready to legislate. And I, have, and I am very proud to say that the Hindu American Foundation played a pivotal role in this. Along with all of you coming to Washington, D.C. earlier this year. And now that this hearing is happening, I want to see everyone here in this room come to Washington, D.C. to support Mr. Guha, to support others. And I hope that I can see each and every one of you in that room because that will ensure, that will send a message to our leaders here in government that your voices need to be heard. They will see the tears on your faces. They will, see, they will see the plight in your eyes, and they will know that they cannot let this happen. The Hindu American Foundation is a very small group in this big sea of advocacy in Washington, D.C. Billions are spent, and there was actually a, a list of organizations and how much money they spent, and we are, to, out of 100 organizations, we are close to the bottom. We are close to the bottom of that, and that is because the Hindu community in the United States is just, un is just beginning to understand what advocacy is. We're just beginning to understand how to use the resources at our advantage, whether it be government, whether it be the media, whether it be the textbooks here in this country. But the Hindu American Foundation is dedicated to being a lasting institution for this generation, my generation, and the coming generations of in this country. And so I would like to close by saying that um, a quote was by Swami Vivekananda Bengali when he says, Arise, awake, and stop not until the goal is reached. And the goal has not been reached yet, but together we are marching towards that goal of a pluralistic society in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kansara. Our next speaker is someone who worked for GHRD for a long time, Global Human Rights Defense, based in Netherlands. She is Jenny, Jenny Lundstrom, and she produced a film uh, titled Culture of Impunity, and she will give her speech, and uh, during that time, she will also uh, show us her uh, film. Jenny Lundstrom. Uh, I also want to thank Sitangsu and the organizers, of course, for uh, uh, inviting me. I'm extremely grateful to be here and uh, to meet also my friends from uh, all over the world, from Sweden, the UK, the US, and Bangladesh even. So that's a, a great honor. Uh, at the same time, I'm a little bit sad that it's needed. Because I've been working in the field of human rights for uh, many years now, since 2007. And uh, minorities in the elections have always been a concern since then, and of course, as we know, far before that too. And I find it very sad because I'm convinced that most people in Bangladesh are peaceful, tolerant, and even secular. And yet, at every election, regardless of which party is in power, there's 10% of the population who are in fear. And there's also an issue that is very uh, underreported internationally, and that's why last year I produced, together with an uh, American filmmaker, a New Yorker, uh, named Miles Rostan, we produced a short film on Bangladesh and minorities um, to, 
to function as a warning signal about the situation. And we produce it for the Dutch television station, and it has been seen since then at many different places. Uh, we had 150,000 people watching it online. I also screen it in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. We screen it to the government, we screen it to policymakers internationally. Uh, in April this year, I organized a big event at the UN on minorities where we also showed the film. So I'm very pleased to be able to show you a short version of it today. Uh, I made it specially for you, and I know that uh, it's already late, so I hope you will bear with me. It's a 20 minute uh, cut of the film, and then I will continue my speech afterwards. Local extremist leaders urge followers to defend their religion against enemies of Islam. For three days, hundreds of followers riot, burning down houses in Hindu neighborhoods and looting. But police don't intervene as rioters prevent fire brigades to come to the people's rescue. Over 10 years earlier, in the 2001 elections, the same party, Shabbat al-Islam, comes into power as part of the coalition. The 2001 election has gone down in history of Bangladesh as one of the most common violences that took place. Those violations mostly took place against religious and ethnic minorities, particularly religious minorities in the communities and other smaller religious communities. And uh, uh, that had a linkage with the party that came to power in coalition with the Ramat Islami. They were at least to have been part of the violation process. We have recorded more than 3,000 incidents of minority persecution that killing, rape, arson, plundering, looting. Hundreds of people who are forced to leave Bangladesh, particularly the members of the Hindu community. I went to India and I shoot there, you know, testimonies. And while coming back to Bangladesh, I was arrested in the airport. They filed a case against me, charged me for treason. After international pressure, Surya Kabir was released. During the years when the extremists were sharing power, 
corruption thrived. You know, this was ranked on top of the list of the countries where corruption is perceived to be highest uh, by Trump.